to invite Nolan up to uh, begin our first um, interview. Hey, Nolan. Thank you. He's our little pro. Yeah, it, is, it takes a little minute to. I know. You have to, you have to create a stage next to you. So, uh, Nolan and I go back several years, and so before getting into some questions, um, we went through, and, and by the way, on the table is the, so interestingly, two of the securities this year, Sea Change and Sandstorm, this is our third time uh, in the security, and we've given you a history of our, uh, our history in this security. So, we invested in a company called Sandstorm Metals and Energy which was a company Nolan started several years ago, which was a much smaller uh, company than Sandstrom Gold, which he also founded uh, how many years ago? Nine. Nine years ago, okay. So we went through, um, well, let me put it this way. Our first purchase of Sandstrom Metals and Energy was at about $3.30 a share, and our last purchase of Sandstorm Metals and Energy was 70% below that at about a dollar a share. So a lot went wrong. Um, we went into it eyes wide open. But during that process, um, I don't think Nolan and I ever had a cross word. Not only that, going through that process, um, my respect for Nolan went up because we were... Um, it was like being in a boat where uh, a leak sprung here and you were trying to take care of it and two hit over here. And you ran over here and three are over here. That's what it was. And uh, so you learn about someone when uh, that happens. And Nolan uh, worked as hard and diligently and left it all in the field as much as I've ever seen anyone in terms of restructuring streams, in terms of just waking up every day. So, a um, lot of history. We, we've talked a lot over the years. We've gotten to know each other. Uh, and this most recent iteration, this third time we're in it, and this is where I think uh, one of the things people often hear me talk about is over time, this business is so dependent on building relationships that are sturdy, reliable, not transactional, uh, that have a genuine uh, uh, friendship to them and genuine respect. What happened uh, and, and how that came into play recently, what, what happened several months ago is Nolan made what was the biggest acquisition in the company's history, uh, a company called Mariana. Um, it was, um, because it's an English company, British company, they couldn't really talk about it because of uh, uh, rules were, were, uh, around the uh, British stock market, and um, the stock sold off significantly because the mine, the, the mine that Mariana owns, is in Turkey. No one kind of understood it, and you know the, the stock kind of got cratered. Craig and Tom and I talked at length, and again, there's a long history here, and basically it boiled down to does Nolan know what he's doing? And because the stock has just gotten creamed and uh, stock was going to be issued in part to make the purchase, so that was kind of uh, throwing people off. And basically, I made the decision, I think no one knows what he's doing. And, we, and it had to be, we really didn't have a lot more to go on other than that, regarding that acquisition. But the history um, and the familiarity and the confidence in Nolan basically is what um, allowed that this third purchase to happen. It turned out to be a very prescient and very uh, a good buy. So, um, with that, let me ask Nolan. My first question uh, is: Describe what a what a stream is and what a royalty is, and just a little uh, tutorial on how your role in basically creating a stream as a financing mechanism to the mining industry. Sure, yeah, I'll start with royalties because they're a bit easier to understand. Everyone kind of understands what generally a royalty is. In the mining <coughs> industry, we have two basic types of royalties. One we call a, an NSR, which stands for net filter 
revenue royalty, which means we get X percentage of the top line revenue of the mining company. So it'll be a 2% NSR, for example, as a normal contract, or 1% NSR, so we get 1 or 2% of their revenue. There's another type of royalty called an MPI, which is a net profits interest royalty, where you just get a certain percentage of a company's profit. Typically, we prefer NSRs to NPIs because you take out the equation of the costs. Um, what we do have one large MPI, which was this last acquisition that we made, and it's going to be one of the lowest cost gold mines in the world, so we're not really concerned about the cost element in, in that particular case. Streams are similar, but a little bit different. A stream is where it's, it's like a royalty, except what you're trying to do is cover a portion of the operating costs of the mining company with a fixed payment every time you get an ounce. So what a typical contract would look like, you know, Jim's got a gold mining company, and he needs to build a mine, and he doesn't have the money. He might raise some equity, and he might come to a company like Sandstorm, and we'll say, Jim, we'll give you $50 million, but then you have to sell 10% of your gold to us, and we'll pay $400 an ounce for it. It doesn't cover all of your operating costs, but it covers some of it for each ounce that we buy. And then, as he mines his mine, what we're hoping to do is buy the gold for $400 an ounce, sell it at spot once the mine's up and running, to do that on a monthly basis, and the goal, the way we really make money for our shareholders is, hopefully, Jim's mine will last five times longer than the actual original feasibility study said it would when they built it up. So what we're looking for for archaeologists are situations where there's lots of exploration upside. That exploration upside just hasn't come to fruition yet. So Jim keeps mining for 50 years, and he keeps having himself gold to us for $400. And so that's, that's the basic business. And so we're, we're capital allocators trying to build a portfolio. And when you start these companies, it's really risky. And first couple years, because day one you've got one asset and it better, it better work. And eventually you get a second one and a third one and, and so on and so forth. So Sandstorm, we're now at the point where we have uh, 160 streams and royalties around the world. 21 of them are already on assets that are operating, so we're getting gold and or cash payments from 21 mines around the world. And we've got about another seven in development and a bunch of uh, large exploration portfolio as well. So that's kind of the business, what we do, in terms of how I got into it and, and the evolution of the business was the first streaming company in the world was a company called Silver Wheaton, they've now renamed themselves Wheaton Precious Metals, and so I was the first employee at that company, it was a, a spin out of a company called Wheaton River Minerals at the time, which became Gold Corp, the second largest gold mining company in the world, and originally it was just a value arbitrage model actually, it was, it was not meant as a, a financing vehicle, it was a gold company, and gold companies typically traded two times that asset value, or at least they did back then, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago when this was created. And silver companies traded at three times that asset value, and the CEO of Gold Corp said, well, I've got a mine in Mexico that's half gold, half silver, how do I get three times for the silver? And he wrote, wrote this contract where you were buying the silver at $4 an ounce for all of the silver produced from this mine, put that contract in a separate company, listed it, and floated about 30% of it, and Gold Corp still owned the majority of it, and then I was sort of sent to run the finances out of it. And shortly after we did that, we had a couple of major base metal mining companies in the world come to us and say, we would like to do that as well, except we don't want shares in the public company, we want cash, because we need to go buy another mine. Both of these companies wanted to go and grow their base metal businesses by liquidating some of their precious metals components. And so we realized, we really had a financing vehicle. So we took Silver Wheat and we grew that to about $5 billion market cap in, in four years. It was a good time because the markets were rising. It was easier to, <laughs> to do that when markets are rising and when they're falling. But uh, it was a lot of fun. The business model has evolved dramatically. So Sandstorm effectively is a financier to mining companies and we buy roads and streams. Thank you. And you, am I right? You're often uh, described as the youngest CFO in New York Stock Exchange history. Is that true? Yeah, or it is. It is. Yeah. Okay. You were 27? Yeah, there was an article actually just out earlier this week because Kraft Heinz just hired a CFO. Oh. He was 29, so the article about how they hired someone who was 29. At the end of the article it says, but so really even hired no one when So when we, so the investment thesis, which is spelled out in your handout, is when we bought Sandstorm recently, we basically take the market cap and we subtract out cash and securities and uh, streams that are not producing 
and not expected to produce for four to five years. We take the streams and we discount them 30% from the company's carrying value. So we come up with a number to basically subtract out of the market cap to measure the free cash flow yield out of the uh, what you're effectively paying for the producing for the cash flow, right? So market cap was I don't know 600 million at the time. Um, well, you have a, a, the math is on there. But when, when we took the market cap and we subtracted out, uh, we, we take their mines, we, we knock them down 30% uh, of their carrying cost by 30%. We take any equities they're holding and we mark them down 50%, et, et cetera. The, uh, and it generates now $50 million in free cash flow. Our effective free cash flow yield was 15%. At a time when, this several months ago, when Franco Nevada and Silver Wheaton are yielding, you know, 5%. So my question, now that's been arbitraged away somewhat with the rise in gold, and, and, but, but nonetheless, the free cash flow yield now would still be, you know, 9%, uh, maybe 10% first. Yeah, Franco so, Nevada, I think, is probably yielding. Yeah, so, so that, that's my, my next question is, Sandstorm generates a lot of cash. Your counterparty strength is now quite strong. It's not what it once was. So the, the counterparties to these streams, the actual mine producers, 79% uh, are now mid-tier or majors. Uh, and that's going to 97% by 2020 or 2022. So, so they're... So, Unlike the old metals and energy, which I talked about a moment ago, where the counterparty strength is very weak, which is part of the problem, here your counterparty strength is quite strong. You're generating a ton of cash. Nonetheless, you trade at a big discount to Silver Wheat and Franklin Nevada on a price to book, on a cap rate. Why is that? I think there's there's a few reasons. But certainly, in the last iteration when you bought shares, there was a couple of very very specific reasons as to why we're trading even more of a discount than we normally do. And so part of it was the announcement of the transaction that we did and, and all the things that Jim mentioned. Part of it was there's a massive rebalancing in the GXJ, which is a, a large gold index. So they were our largest shareholder. They own 20% of us. And they just completely changed their calculation methodology because under Canadian securities regulations, you can't own more than 20%. Of any one company, if you buy more than twenty percent of their shareholders, we have to take a takeover on the entire company and, and offer to buy all the shares. And so this index is running into a bunch of problems. And so they, they recalculated it so that they sold sixty percent of all of their existing positions and to brought in much larger companies so they continue to, to grow. And so they ended up having to sell, I think it was eleven million shares of Sandstorm on one day and just destroyed our share price. And that was right before we announced this transaction. So it was just sort of leg down after leg down, and, uh, and that's caused this, this sort of acute uh, underperformance in the share price. We've bounced back from that now. Um, the, the broader theme of why we traded a lower valuation is going to take longer periods of time, and it's a communication effort. So people remember, people who haven't looked at Sandstorm since 2010, remember Sandstorm as that junior mining streaming and royalty company where all the counterparties are junior mining companies and not a lot of diversification in the portfolio. We had sort of five cash flowing assets at the time and there was a lot of risk there. And that was right when the commodity downturn happened. So everything got obliterated. The average gold mining company was down at 86%. It was, I've got a couple of employees who've been in the business for 50 years and they'll say hands down those two years were the worst two years of the full stop in our industry. And so a lot of people, the generalist investors, have looked at Sandstorm since 2010. And so that's part of my job is to say, hey, we're, we're a little different right now. Our counterparty strength is completely radically transformed. We have this massive portfolio that's diversified all around the world. We've got majors as our, our counterparties. The cost of producing gold at the mines is probably half of what it would have been back in 2010. And so it's a completely different company. So that's a, that's a long communication. Yeah. Yeah. And if you read, uh, I think we wrote about Sandstorm in our first quarter letter. And we talked about, and this was, I can't remember with Mariana. Uh, yeah, this is Mariana had been announced. That was but one of the things we, we noted that we really think we're arbitraging is this issue of the market really not appreciating the counterparty strength now in Sandstorm and that it is still viewed as having smaller miners on the other side of their streams. And it's just not the case. And as that 
it's communicated uh, uh, there's really no reason why you shouldn't trade more at parity with Franklin Nevada. And so that we, uh, we hope that one day uh, one of these big boys uh, offers us a 5% cap rate. And Nolan has assured me he will take the phone call. <laughs> uh, so moving on, you recently made uh, what appears to be a game-changing acquisition in, in Mariana. Mariana owns a this asset that no one will talk about called Hot Modern in Turkey. Uh, the indications are this is an extremely compelling asset, break-even mine, uh, $400 an ounce, which is unheard of in terms of the mine being profitable at that level of gold uh, price. Uh, expected to double your production in, in, uh, in 22, and a preliminary economic assessment report completed by largest firm doing this in the world, Runge Pinnock, uh, that placed the hot modern asset at close to a $1.4 billion value, which would translate into Sandstorm's 30% position at $410 million. You purchased it for under $200 million. Uh, we hold it in our analysis, by the way, at cost. This is the only asset in our calculation that we hold that cost, the others that they carry, we, we uh, knocked down 30%. Um, question, did you really steal this? And if if it's so good, uh, why were you able to buy Mariana at what you believe is a bargain price? Now, we had dinner last night, and so I've learned the, the answer to this, which I didn't fully appreciate. So kind of Reader's Digest, can you walk through how you Put yourself in a position to really become a 30% owner of this this fabulous asset, and then you can talk about, which I'm sure is there on everyone's mind, the uh, the political risk of being in Turkey. I think the reason that we got a really good deal in this transaction was twofold. One, we uh, were intelligent with the information we got, and very strategic, but we also got very very lucky with how we got the, how we came across this opportunity. So. This asset is owned and operated by, and to put it in perspective, it's a development asset, so they're just finishing a technical studies permitting what to go put it in production over the next few years. But it's owned and operated by one of the largest conglomerates in Turkey called Lady Made in Chile. So it's a private company with a large mining arm. And the 30% net profit interest was owned by a junior exploration company traded in London that nobody had heard of. And it was uh, completely off everybody's radar. In 2015, the first drillables went into the project, and those were the discovery rules when they realized they had something incredibly special there. So to put it in perspective, if, if you're drilling and you find five grams gold over five meters, that's a decent drillable. If you get seven grams gold over two meters, that's a decent drillable. Um, this asset is about 25 grams gold over 40 meters. And so they're putting in holes that were 100 meters at a time of 20 grams gold and 4% copper, all in the same hole. It's just incredible ore body. Except nobody was seeing the press releases because private companies don't put out press releases <laughs> when they stick uh, drill holes in. The reason we came across it was because uh, we were in the process of buying a few royalties from a Canadian company that literally is opposite the street. US called Tech Resources, which is a, a large international mining base metal company, and they do a lot of exploration work uh, around the world, and they collect royalties, and every now and then they sell them off, so they had collected a couple of royalties, and we paid $17 million and bought them, and we were diligencing the package, and we came across this thing called Hot Modern, and went, what's that? We've never heard of it. <coughs> never heard of it. And we uh, went and started doing our diligence and realized it's one of the most incredible discoveries that's happened on planet Earth in the last 15 years. And so we went out and immediately went to Mariana, which is the company that trades in London that owns 30% of their profits interest. And I offered to become their large shareholder. They need some cash to do some exploration work in Argentina and for a few other things. And, and they sold us what effectively was a full blocking stake in their company uh, right before anyone had, had seen this. Subsequently, the mine ended up winning a bunch of awards publicly at big conferences like PDAC for having the best drillables in the world at the time for 2015 and won uh, Discovery of the Year Award. And the value of Mariana kept kind of going up and up and up. And we decided to jump before it, it, it went too far. It 
the value didn't go too high because no one could get into a bidding war because no one could buy up at Sandsburg because we had that collective stake. And when we finally did make an offer for the company, we didn't have any interlopers because no one else could buy. We just would have voted their, their deal down. So we were lucky in terms of we found it first by mistake. <laughs> Uh, but I think we were pretty strategic with what we did with that information once we found it out. And the, and the blocking stake uh, was a result of the more um, restrictive uh, uh, regulations in England. Yeah, the UK is, I don't even want to get started about UK regulations. So in, in Canada and the United States, if, if we're a public company, we want to hold a shareholder vote, we set a record date. And you guys are shareholders on the record date, we send out voting cards to all of you to vote. If you sell your shares the next week, then you still get to vote because you're the shareholder on the record date. And so theoretically, 100% of shareholders can't vote. In the UK, for, for this vote, for example, if you're a shareholder today, we'll mail you a voting card, but the record date's not until 48 hours before the vote. So you get a voting card, you sell your shares to someone else over there, you're no longer eligible to vote. So if you do vote with your voting card, you your votes get deleted before they get counted. The person you sold your shares to are theoretically eligible to vote, but they don't get a voting card, so they actually can't, can't vote. So usually, depending on how much turnover there is between announcement and the actual 48 hours before the vote, only a small portion of the shareholders are actually eligible. So we, we ended up getting 28% of shareholders vote. and. Uh, the guys who had the votes couldn't believe we got that high of a percentage. <laughs> and you own 12% of the stock. And we own 12% of the stock, and you need 70% of shareholders to vote yes for a deal under UK takeover rules for it to go through. So if you own 12% of the 28, you know what else to buy. Yeah. And, and to be clear, at the time when Sandstorm stock was selling off in the announcement of the Mariana deal, we didn't know any of this. We didn't. So we knew, you know, we knew the stock was, you know, we knew what the cash flow, what the existing streams was. We didn't know any of this background, but I think what we did know is we basically said, you know, we think no one knows what he's doing, whatever the hell he is doing. And, uh, and now to learn the story is really um, underscores that view. Um, besides Hot Modern, what stream are you most excited about in the portfolio? Well, that's a good question. Well, I think I'm going to answer it a different way. I think the thing I'm most excited about the portfolio is the fact that there's a whole ton of things happening in the portfolio. Uh, as soon as equity started coming back to mining companies in sort of uh, 2016, mid 2016, right around when, when Brexit happened, the, the amount of drilling that we saw on our properties went through the roof. So. At an average year of drilling, well, not an average year, let's say 2014, there's about 30,000 meters drilled on properties in our portfolio. Nobody was drilling in 2014. There is no money to be had for exploration in the mining industry. Compare that to 2016, we had 500,000 meters drilled in exploration on various ends for properties around the world. It's just a huge amount of mining uh, gold that's happening on all of our properties. So, we have a number of mines being built right now. I'm excited about most of them. The next major one that's going to come online is an asset called Cerro Moro. It's operated by a multi billion dollar company called Humana Gold, and it's one of their best assets. And we should get about $13 million of capital per year from that stream that starts up in 2019. Got it. And, and Yamana and Tech, that you referred to a moment ago, those were bought around two years ago. Why don't we uh, have up for some questions. I've got a couple, but I know we've got some time constraints, so. Uh, Joe? The banker in the end. Yes. You talked about the counterparty risk. Yeah. What is the structure under which you have the claim on the stream? I mean, are these companies allowed to pledge their assets to other people so that you really have sort of an unsecured claim on the gold? So Great question. That's a good question. We don't go unsecured. So there's really, I'll break it down into two broad categories. I'm oversimplifying this a bit, but in royalties, there are some countries where a royalty runs with and is binding on the title. So you own it free and clear. No one can take it away from you, even for bankruptcy. So someone goes bankrupt and the mine gets liquidated 
bank C security of the assets. Real property, like, like an yeah. oil royalty yeah. here. So it's really, exactly. And so, but there are some countries where it doesn't, where the actual mineral concessions are deemed to be owned by the government. So the government always has the right to take them back in a bankruptcy, theoretically, if they want. You know, I've never seen the government do that, but because of that, the royalty doesn't run with that law. And so you have to treat those royalties like streams. And so streams are just a contract. And the contract is only as good as, say, the counterparty backing it and being security that is, that is backing that. And so what we do is we either go A, senior secure, or B, we go into a bit of more of a complex structure where if you're the banker, we'll say, we will support A to you if we get a intercreditor agreement with you that says that you are liable to ensure that if you see security and sell it to someone else, that my contract transfers with it. And if I lose money, I can sue you for the value of my contract. So obviously no, no bank wants to take that risk to they always ensure the contract transfers. One of the things we saw through the metals and energy experience, because you, because these were smaller miners, you did have some bankruptcies and you had uh, real live walkthroughs of these situations. <coughs> and, uh, uh, I know in one very quickly, uh, I'll tell you, uh, Nolan um, took a, um, well, this was uh, where you took the 5% MSR and renegotiated it to a half rather than putting up the capital. It would have gone to one. And it was kind of a head fake by saying, look, we could raise the capital and you still have to pay us five or uh, let's renegotiate this at two and a half. And uh, you basically didn't have the capital, but it was a threat of raising the capital. And so they end up getting negotiated often. Uh, but, but to use your example of $400 an ounce, let's say, that, that you would contract to buy X amount, I mean, can you force them to produce? Even if the production costs exceed no, that? No, so that's that's where all the upfront work goes in, is making sure okay. that we're investing in assets that are of high quality. <coughs> that, that it's in their economic yeah. interest to produce. Yeah. Correct. And if you look, Joe, at the walkthrough on the valuation, when we when we look at the expected cash flow if gold fell to a thousand, that takes into account mines that we think would stop producing. Right, because at a thousand they might stop doing that. The, the risk here, which the, if, if you got to persistent nine hundred dollar gold, not just kind of dipping down there, popping up because no, you know, big majors aren't going to. But if the gold dropped to nine hundred and kind of stayed there, you'd have a lot of shut in mind. That that would have been true years ago, but now it's uh, not, not not necessarily true today. I think we have gold. Really, really so you're buying a portion of their production. So some of it, they're going to be able to sell at, at the market. Yeah, and that's one of the valuable lessons that we yeah. learned through, through the years that I've been doing this, is that you don't want to ever take so much of the economics that they are now disincentivized to invest in their own asset. You want them to want to invest in that asset. Harvey. Thanks, Jim. Nolan, uh, Jim touched on a question that I didn't hear the answer of, but I was hoping that you would comment on it, which is, uh, the political risk um, of Turkey, and by political risk, um, obviously political risk writ large, but also um, rule of law and taxation regimes changing. In other words, changing the rules of the game for, for foreigners. Yeah, so fortunately, I'll start with the tax one. That, that's a little bit easier. So structure ourselves so we pay tax on all of our streams. For most of that tax is paid in Canada, we because we are we don't have permanent establishments in most of these countries. Sometimes we can voluntarily choose to pay tax there, and then we get a foreign tax credit in Canada. But uh, generally speaking, our contracts are structured. The, the government went crazy and decided to have some sort of super profit tax. It wouldn't affect us most likely because we were able to actually sell the gold externally in our profits that are offshore, and then we would pay taxes to Canadian company. Uh, having said that, when governments attempt to and this is a normal thing in mind, especially in African countries, <laughs> is they'll put in these super profit taxes and, and try to really hurt the miners. That does hurt the mining company and the amount of money that they're making from their mine, but not so much the financial provider to your bank that has lent money to that company. Super profit taxes apply here. It stands for super profit taxes apply here, just applies to the mining company. So that's, that's much less of a risk. So tax is a fairly low risk thing for us. 
In terms of broader political risk, I think there's I think two broad comments. One is, in my view, the best way to deal with political risk in our business is diversification. We've got a portfolio, and so we try not to concentrate political risk in any one jurisdiction. I live in British Columbia, which is a fantastic place. It's one of the best places in the world to live. But the political risk is through the roof for mining companies where we are, because we went from having a reasonable, business-friendly government to left-wing socialists who were sharing power with the Green Party, who want to stop all development of everything, including bridges and that. I mean, they're <coughs> constructing a large bridge, which I was looking forward to having an easier drive to work, and they just stopped it because it would cause more cars and air pollution, and so bridges are better. <laughs> so political risk can show up anywhere, and one saying that we have in the industry is you, you can change the politicians, but you can't change the rocks. So the goal is invest in really, really good assets. And if a politician goes crazy in a jurisdiction for a while, you just sit and you wait. You let the rest of the portfolio make money for you. You don't press it, and when the politician change again, then you go back in. So you have to take a long time for rise in. In Turkey, there's a huge gap between what people see in the media versus what it's actually like on the ground right now. So uh, you know, my wife phones me. <laughs> There was, there was a suicide bombing here. Uh, Twelve people died in this time not much long ago, and I had just come back from a trip. And it was actually my mom ended up phoning me, going, oh, I saw that 12 people died. Are you okay? <coughs> <coughs> well, okay, mom. People get murdered all the time in Vancouver in a shooting, and there's one million people in the downtown Vancouver area, and when one person dies, you don't call me up and say, are you okay? There's 12 million people in Istanbul. That's the same ratio. That's, that's used logic, so it's you know no riskier there than it would be in, in Vancouver or on those types of things. There is a bit of a political regime thing going on there, but the um, stock market's in an all time high in last year. Business, business on the ground is actually good. Well, can you comment on the 70% the, the the, the owner of the hot modern asset is owned by an entity that is run by Erdogan's uh, brother in law? Yeah, so we're very we're politically aligned. But I don't take that for granted because regimes change. So, yeah. you, you put, I guess, it's hard. you, you put uh, a coup at a low probability because it because a, a, a actual coup could could result in expropriation. That, I don't I don't see expropriation in Turkey. So we talk about tax and political stability. So Turkey is actually one of the jurisdictions that hasn't changed tax on mining companies in, as long as we can remember. So it's. It's a fairly stable, business-friendly country in terms of a business operating environment. I don't imagine it could result in expropriation of businesses. Mm -hmm. In terms of the way we think about it, you know, it, it is a risk, and it's a reason why you know Sandstone wouldn't be you know a seven percent position in our portfolio. Again, at a certain price, it might. And to be clear, which I pointed didn't make earlier, we've never bought Sandstorm ever with any view on gold. We, we, we have no view on gold, have no view on gold today. We have always bought it simply as a result of a current free cash flow yield based on current gold spot price, looking at what that free cash flow yield would be with a, say, a 20% drop in gold. And we basically arbitraged, you know, we basically bought it when it's trading at a 10% plus free cash flow yield. And, Kind of looking to sell it at around six, and that, that's the way we looked at it. It's the way we'll look at it now. Maybe with the hot modern asset, we'll hang out a little longer because there's so much production is doubling in 22. Not cash flow, but production is because of some of these taxes. Uh, but that's we, we've never we've never had a view on gold in, in our. Uh, and I don't know if you, you, you want to just lastly mention. Whether you have a view on gold and, and, and what, what. Yeah, I actually run a business very similar to the way you invest in our business, which is I, although I have my personal opinions on gold, I don't really take those into account when we're making investments. We, we need the investment to make a lot of sense, A, in the current gold price, and B, at we try to take more conservative views on what the gold price might be going forward in case we're wrong. So there's that margin of, of error there. So, for example, with gold at 13.30 right now, we'll be making investments say, this has to be a really, really smart transaction at $1,150 to $1,200 gold. And 
my personal view is I think gold is going to go up, but I don't know what's coming around the corner economically. I don't know if we're going to move into a period of economic inflation or we're going to have a credit, credit crisis first. Gold's going to do very different things in most of these situations. If it's inflation, gold's going to go higher. If it's credit crisis, gold's going to crash and then go higher. Um, I don't know what gold's going What's the average price on the streams? What's your average purchase price across your portfolio? It's a great question. So if you look across the entire portfolio, and so royalties, the way we look at it, is sort of like getting the ounce for zero, mm -hmm. and streams are different numbers of different contracts, some are 400, some are 500, some are 350. But if you average the whole portfolio, we're set to $280 an ounce. So our, our free cash flow per ounce is about $1,040. It's a very simple uh, business model, Susan. So they literally gold right now is going for thirteen fifty. They're producing about uh, fifty five thousand ounces a year. Thirteen fifty less that two eighty times fifty five thousand is their income, uh, is their revenue, and there's about five six million dollars operating expenses at the hold co. And the rest is free cash flow. I mean it's. I think, Todd, did you have questions? Yes. Do you um, look at or study or, or have considered any of the more industrial metals and, and other, yeah, kind of, how does that kind of factor? Yeah, we, we do have a little bit in our portfolio, so we've got a little bit of copper, a little bit of zinc, and we have some diamonds actually. So we have a 1% royalty on one of the, the largest diamond mines in the world. We produce 7 million carats of diamonds a year, so we have 1% of that. Um, we tend not to go into the more obscure metals. We've sort of learned the hard way that our, our technical team, we're, they're very, very good at hard rock geology, but when you start getting into things that are not hard rock mining, there are other commodities that that's not where our strength is. We just stick to hard rock mining. Please give a hand to uh, Nolan.